No, no. All right. I'm gonna trade you two sheep for that wood. Tell me, honey, does that sound good? Cause all I really wanna do is take away longest road from you, yeah. Welcome to these tabletop sessions. Welcome to the, welcome to the, welcome to these tabletop sessions. Hello fellow gregarious geeks and gamers. Welcome to the 27th episode of the Tabletop Sessions podcast, where we talk about all things tabletop related that have been occupying the hearts and minds of this international group of gamers over the course of the last three weeks. My name is Elias, and with me this week, it's Belinda, Puck, and Titania, and other such bodies orbiting Uranus. Say hi, guys. Hi, guys. Dima here. Hello, everybody. Hi, it's Brian, and it, to me, it didn't sound like you said puck. It sounded like another word. <laughs> and what about Uranus? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I really believe that's the reason they've changed, like, all of a sudden everyone's saying Uranus instead of Uranus, but it's Uranus. <laughs> that's, the, that's, that's what we grew up <laughs> saying. Uh, anyone understand this uh, trivia this week, or you're all still... Mm-hmm, totally. Got it. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm, yeah, I understand I'm, it. Uh, yeah. uh, Belinda. <laughs> Damn. Okay. <laughs> People wanted me to reference the introduction to the fact that he's born on the 27th of June. So I should use the number 27 because he was born on the 27th. Like, that was enough of an interesting factoid for Ipo <laughs> that he was born on the 27th. <laughs> and, and this is the 27th episode. Yes, and you know what has 27 moons? Uranus. Seriously? So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Uranus has 27 moons. No way. Three of Whoa. which are Belinda, Puck, and Titania. 27? Today, I was looking up a little fact relating to 27, and my favorite one was Bruce Lee was born on the 27th of whatever, 1940, whatever. Then they just randomly say, and was also one of the first people to try contact lenses. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> His martial arts success meant nothing. Contact lenses, everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's something to talk about. <laughs> Enter the cornea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how have you guys been? Ipo Byron? Uh, we have been uh, silent for the last, uh, I don't know, since the lockdown. Because... I'm working from home, so I have uh, limited uh, contact with uh, human beings. And this recording is uh, kind of a, a very nice moment for me. <laughs> oh, the, the highlight of the month. <laughs> okay, that was a really sad story. <laughs> Byron, do you have something that more uplifting to uh, I don't think I could top that. <laughs> Ipo, do you need anything? <laughs> Can we send you videos of no. ourselves? No, or... you can send him uh, e-hugs. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm okay. I think with this medicine I'm taking, right now, I'm, 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 I'll, I'll be pretty oh fine. God. Okay, so guys, speaking about planets and isolation, we recently played <laughs> <laughs> Fields of Arl, which is like a really obscure place in east frisia in germany and and it's kind of like a long lost place um long lost <laughs> unheard so, so of it, it, so <laughs> wait wait so it's on a planet and you're kind of is isolated exactly. of the ur urban environment exactly. so you're on an island in the middle of nowhere <laughs> So this game was designed by Uwe Rosenberg, published by Z-Man Games in 2014, and the art was, was done by Dennis Lohausen. I don't think I need to mention it, but Uwe Rosenberg's super-duper famous games like Agricola, Caverna, La Havre, A Feast for Odin. Bonanza. Just in case, Bonanza. Bonanza, one of my favorite <laughs> games. <laughs> I have to mention that this is the only game of Uwe Rosberg that I haven't played. 
So I'm very curious to. Really? Uh, wow. You've played Heimgeist? Yeah. Of. What? <laughs> <laughs> Use the English <laughs> title, please. Don't. English title is Hein, guys. <laughs> no, that's the Icelandic, like, uh, Icelandic for ag Agricola. Uh, it was one of the small box games he released before um, Feast for Odin. And it was generally considered to be the worst game he's ever designed. Is it, so, is it in his, God. like, BGG list of design games? Yeah. Or did yeah. they exclude it? He used, it? Okay. The, he used <laughs> a different name. <laughs> Uh, okay, so Fields of Arl is a one to two player game. I know this is gonna shock you guys, but it's a farming game. <gasps> yeah, you guys. Actually, what it shocked me is that it's a one to two player game. I thought it was like four or yeah, five, it's like huge. the other one. It so seems like know. it's a game for four yeah, to six the players. The box is the size of the Caverna box, it's a yeah. bit bigger, actually. Yeah. And <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> So the game. So, yeah. so it was. It was aimed. It was aimed to be a two-player game, right? Not not the solo, I guess. The solo game in Fields of Arl is considered to be one of the best like solo games you can play. So oh, I haven't tried it. Though. Okay. Yeah, we've only tried it two players. Basically, the game is over four point five years, <laughs> <laughs> and you can score points that, in amazing. one point and half points. <laughs> So just to give you guys an idea of the game Dima, experience. please, you're making it, you're exaggerating. It's not 4.5 years, it's nine half years, okay? Come on. So each year is divided in two seasons, summer and winter. And then you go like summer, winter, nine times. Okay, so I think there are five summers and four winters. Correct. And just to meet oh. everybody's expectations when playing an Uwe Rosenberg game, there's a scoring booklet, guys! <laughs> we can go through oh, <laughs> all your nice. resources and everything you purchased in the game and <laughs> count your score. I, I, I want to say it sounds better when you say it's five summers and four winters than when you say it's uh, four and a half years. <laughs> <laughs> I was just being mean. <laughs> <laughs> so there are a lot of yes. really interesting words in the game like bogs and peat and dikes and you realize you know nothing about farming when <laughs> learning the game to be um, fair i'm pretty sure most farmers don't know what bogs peats and dikes are. <laughs> <laughs> um what are they? the game <laughs> the game could be overwhelming <laughs> at first when you look at it but you you get the hang of it at some point uh, so each player has four workers. You have 28 total actions on the board, but they're split into two. So you have 14 summer actions and 14 winter actions. Basically, it's, it's a worker placement. So yeah. when she says you have 28 actions, she means 28 action spots on the board. So in summer, you can do the summer actions, but one of the players can do a winter action, so an action from the other season that you're not in. When we're doing the summer season, for example, one of the two players can place a worker in the other season, so in winter. If you do that, then in the next season, you're giving up first player. So if you are first player, you'll give it up, and if you're not first player, you still won't be first player next turn. <laughs> you can also... In the game, just like in Caverna, you can build buildings, like build stalls, stables, build buildings that have one-time abilities, and they give you points at the end of the game. You can also build vehicles to travel, sell your goods for food and points, and you can also upgrade your goods with vehicles. So if you have, for example, leather, you can upgrade it to a leather jacket. That sounds so much like the other. Yes. Uh, I, I think it the idea, is. though, of that is, yeah. let's say you have leather, you're taking it into town to, like, the tanner, and then the tanner is going to make, like, leather wear out of it. Or if you have clay, you're sending it into town to turn it into bricks. I think that's the the idea of, of putting goods in a cart and then later having them be upgraded. And another thing that's unique about this game is you can upgrade your tools. So next to each action, um, there's a tool track and you can use your turn to upgrade your tools. So for example, if you're going fishing, usually when you place your worker there, 
you can get initially two food per fish trap you have. But as you upgrade your fish traps, you can eventually get up to seven food by doing that action. So you can become more efficient by upgrading your tools, which is a nice touch that's not there in games like Caverna and Agricola. Yeah, exactly. So so like you're, nice, yeah. you're increasing the efficiency of that same worker. So the same single worker on a fishing spot can get better if you upgrade the tools that are relevant for fishing. So that's a cool, really cool aspect that I don't think I've ever seen on a worker placement. Yeah, that was different. And there is the same aspect, like you have your animals and you have your fields that give you resources. So all those things are similar to his other games. Um, I found it overwhelming at first when I saw the board laid out. I felt the same way right before playing Feast for Odin. So it really is a lot to take in, especially the building action. So all those tiles, just going through them to know what options you have, it's it's a lot. And, um, and that's a very interesting point, Dima, because the um, the buildings, in a way, they inform your strategy for that game. Because mm -hmm. the, the biggest thing that scores you points in the entire game are your building. Correct. So trying to target which building you're going to get so you don't just get points, but you get the right ability. The cool thing is every game, the buildings are different. So yeah. Yes, it's a little bit overwhelming if you're new to the game and you're not used to the iconography, but it's pretty simple. I mean, I think you you'd agree with me that it became simpler the more times we played it. Yeah, we played the game several times, and as we played it, it became more. So it it was like the last time we played, we took like two minutes and we literally ran through all the buildings, and then we all had the same information and moved into the game. A hundred percent agreed. So I think just like Caverna, the first game. Um, getting to know the buildings can feel overwhelming. So, and also, I remember in my first game, um, I couldn't decide which tracks to upgrade, which buildings to build, which animals to focus on. I, I just felt like I didn't know what the strategy of like the game was, which is, I guess, a normal thing. But you, you feel it a lot. Dima. This sounds very much like Caverna. Why is this a two-player game and not a five-six like Caverna? What's the difference? Is there any interaction? So I would say there's interaction in the worker placement aspect between the players. Is, yeah, yeah, which is similar to Caverna that you can you can block each other or take something first. So that's the only interaction. Um, no, no. What else? No, I think the central concept of this game is that it's a two-player game, mm -hmm. like. No, no, I, I have specific examples. So one of the best things about this game is the fact that there are eight workers every turn. You cannot have more children. You cannot have more people. There's four workers for you, four workers for me. Mm -hmm. But only one worker can go to do the other season's action. So um, not one worker for each of us, one worker total. So oh. of the eight workers, a single worker can basically time travel <laughs> and go to the other. This is a game about peat farming and time travel. You can go to the other season and, and do an action from there. And it's super critical because, for example, so, the so, summer sorry, season. Sorry, so this, this guy is crazy and it's summertime <laughs> and he thinks like, guys, I feel like chill. Like it's, it's exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I'm going to do like so, a winter thing. That's 100% correct. So. But what's so important about that is, yes, there's 14 actions on each side, but, and there's some in common, but for the most part, the most of the actions in the summer are different than the winter. So in the summer, it's much easier. What you get in the summer is you can collect resources, wood, clay, you can plant fields, you can do all sorts of things. You can build much easier. In the winter, it's way harder to build. Yeah. It's almost impossible to collect any raw resources. The main thing you're doing in the winter is you're 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 turning animals into food and hide. Yeah. You're upgrading things. You're converting the resources you collected in the summer into things in the winter. Sellable goods. Exactly. Sellable goods. So like in the last game we played, it was I mean, it wasn't super critical, but like it was worth about three points to me 
that Dima, on her first action, because she was first player, chose to go to the winter side and take up the only spot that would have given me the two animals I needed, which would have given me like three more points. Oh. So there was no option to do that in the summer section. So it's it's actually incredibly important to see who goes first mm-hmm. and who grabs that. So mm-hmm. there is that balance constantly in the game. Like, are you gonna grab that action and give up first your your first place next turn, mm-hmm. your first uh, being first player next turn, or are you gonna let me have it and then you know I might. So there's there's a lot of like you're always considering what the other player might want to do. So I think being a two player game is central to this game. It's not just oh. There's interaction because you might take my spot. That's true of any worker placement game. Yeah. And you can be mean um. <laughs> in this game. <laughs> Or you should be. And you can be mean unintentionally. <laughs> so Elias, I think it was round seven of the game. And he was looking intently at the board. And he was just looking like counting, like m- nodding his head. Like one, two, three four. Like he had, he had planned his whole turn. And then I'm like, okay, I'm first. I place my first worker and he's like, no, that was my first action. No. <laughs> so it's, it's, I guess you could screw another person over, but it's not. There are other ways. <laughs> possible, yeah, other ways to get to the same ending, but it's probably less efficient. Um, so, yeah, but it's just like any other worker placement game. Um, overall, I had a great experience. Um, and I enjoyed it more every time I played it. So there was less confusion every time I played it. Like Elias said... And you, you got better. <laughs> yes, I did get better. First game, I decimated her. And then like at the end, she was kicking my ass. So <laughs> um, Elias is really, really good at animals. Like he breeds like I've never seen. Like, I don't know if you guys have been to our Instagram page, but like his farm, like there was, there were so many animals. There was no more room for them. I, bu- I-, I built Mumu <laughs> farm from Mario Kart 64. It was just mm-hmm. cows everywhere. <laughs> so there's enough variability in the game from the different buildings that come in. And like Elia said, you get familiar with the different kinds of buildings, like, and the kind of abilities they give you. So it just, gets easier to sort of strategize what would you say compared to caverna or uh, feast for odin is it better or is it is it even comparable it's better strategically than caverna it's not as charming as caverna so caverna has the charming aspect of building your cave um and the little farm it doesn't have that charming aspect you don't really get into the whole oh look at my farm look at my house thing That's not there in this game, but strategically, it's a better game, I think. Do you feed your workers? You do, mm-hmm. you do, yes. And you have oh, to okay. pay for heat for the winter, so... But like Elias convert. said, because you keep your four workers, it's just the same amount of food every time. So it's not like Caverna where you're being burdened by having to... Children, yeah. Get more food. I, I think it's better than A Feast for Odin, period. But I'm not the best example because I didn't like the A Feast for Odin that much. I felt like it was inferior to Caverna and Agricola. I felt like there was too much in that game. Like the Tetris aspect was completely unnecessary. Um, oh, and then, I totally and agree. Then prete- have we reviewed that game? No, we haven't. And then it pretends to have 68 actions, but there's actually like eight. <laughs> and then each of them, there's like nine variations of each one. If you do this one, yeah. you can also get a fish, yeah. you know? That's and a unique co- action. It's bullshit. Yeah. So... Um, <laughs> <laughs> There's too much in that game. He needed to streamline it. I don't usually like streamlining, but he needs to streamline it and just uh, stop being so annoying. This game, it looks as intimidating as, feel, as Fields for Odin. Yes. Of a Feast for Odin, but it's not. It's, looks it, being the key word. Yeah, yeah looks. But, but the strategy is great. Every time we played it, I tried something else. Um, you mm-hmm. do have to do a little bit of everything, like in every Over Rosenberg game. Mm-hmm. But you, you can, like in the last game, I got like 20... 20 points from animals and Dima got five and she still beat me in the game. So you don't need to get all the points and everything. I I agree with um, the comparison to Caverna. It's more strategic. Um, Caverna, I felt was a simpler version of this game. Yeah. And in terms of Feast for Odin, I agree. Like 
I completely agree. Fispa Odin was just, it was too much. And I didn't feel like playing it more often helped me strategize better or enjoy the game more. I still felt like it was overwhelming. This game, it's not. Like once you get familiarized with the buildings, like in Caverna, that's it. That's all you need to focus on. And then you strategize upgrading your tools and um, breeding your animals, getting your resources like towards those tiles. And what I did like actually more than Caverna is that in Caverna, if you don't get buildings for endgame scoring, um, then you're at a disadvantage, I always felt. In this game, there is no endgame scoring tiles. You just... Each building you buy has a, a score listed on it, and that's what you'll get at the end of the game. You know what I mean? Okay. So I, I like mm. that, but because I didn't feel like there was any point in the game where you could be at a disadvantage. It's just all available there, but yeah. It's a much tighter game. It's a much, like, yes, like the, game, the game feels better designed than most of his other games. Mm-hmm. Um. I, I'm a fan of Ulver Rosenberg, but I also sometimes feel like he recycles the same idea with slightly, and he's definitely recycling ideas here. But the the balance, because it's just a two player game, is is tight. He's he's done a very tight design. Yes, and and in Caverna, one thing I remember is the red rubies. Yes, they were like jokers. You could convert them into anything. Correct. Into anything. In a f- Fields of Arl, it's not like that. The the peat, you can only convert it into the basic resources. Yeah. So the five basic resources. Correct. You can't convert it into animals or wood or clay, like the expensive stuff. So it's not that overpowered. Yeah, agreed. And I like that. Agreed. Okay, guys, you made me want to play the game. Okay, thanks. Well, <laughs> let me just, a couple of quick things. As I said, I've already talked about what I like about the game, really. I'm not going to take time, but I love how tight it is. I also like that it's not hard to feed your people. Like, yeah. it's not. But that usually sucks. Like, I prefer the fact that it's harder to feed your people in Agricola to the fact that it's easy to feed your people in Caverna. But the reason that this game works better for me is that in Caverna, I almost never felt like someone blocked me for something. Mm-hmm. Um, in this game, even though it's not hard to feed your people, it is hard to accomplish things if somebody for example, takes a winter action during the summer and you really needed a winter action that turn. It could throw you off completely. So it does have that thing which Caverna doesn't have, which is, oh, you really screwed me over here, you know? So I really like that. I, As I said, I love the time traveler thing and <laughs> I love that it's only one time traveler for half year because... Um, that's that's a very big aspect of how tight the game is and the strategic aspect of the two players. And most importantly, the cows have spots on them. <laughs> so they're, oh. <laughs> they're like, they're actual little cow meeples, but they have spots. Like the cows in Caverna are just like brown cows. These guys are white cows with black spots on oh. them. <laughs> and I think that's incredibly important. In <laughs> These are actually... <laughs> <laughs> I do have two negatives in the game. One is the board layout. It's a minor thing, but it's very important to know that this game is fucking massive. Like the reason I bought this game is that somebody nearby put on a Facebook group for trade said, I bought this game. I set it up. It could not physically fit on my table. So I'm selling it. <laughs> so it, it's, True story. it's massive. But also the action board is this super long vertical board, but the way that your um, your player boards are also vertical, it's almost impossible unless you have the biggest table, the widest table in the world, to put it in between the two of you. So it's going to be off to the side, and that's what they recommend in the setup. It's a minor thing, but basically it ends up meaning one of you can read like the bottom half clearly and not really see the top half, and the other one can see the top half and not really see the bottom half. So unless you're very familiar with the game, you're going to be asking what stuff does. You're going to be getting up and looking at it. It's just a small thing, <laughs> but it's it's important. It's important to know that if you're the kind of person that gets frustrated with the way a game looks on the table or takes too much space or whatever. 
It's an awkward layout. It is a very awkward layout. And secondly, this one is more important. I think the game is one to two rounds too long. It's not a long game. It's under two hours easy. Um, I think last game we played was like 90 minutes or less. Yeah. It's one to two rounds, but it, it's one to two rounds too long. Half years too long. And the reason I say that is the most valuable buildings in the game, there's three of them. They're each worth 15 points, which is a lot of points in this game. So that just technically feels like an end game thing. Like at the end of the game, I'm going to finally be able to buy one of these expensive buildings. But you can usually do that around six to seven. So what ends up happening, maybe around eight maximum. So what ends up happening is usually in round nine, the last round, instead of doing something epico, instead you're doing like, oh, this will give me one more point or I can reduce one of my negative points by doing this. So it has that negativity to it. So, or maybe you, you guys are amazing and the play oh, testers were, yeah. uh, <laughs> we're doing it in the ninth. Uh. Like, like, like to put it, it, it feels, it feels like you pass the climax a bit too early in the game. And I'll give you an example. In the last game we played I, in my last, my last action, I looked at all my the actions and said, okay, I have six different actions that would give me one point. That was everything. <laughs> like, uh, that's what I could do. I could gain one point in six different ways. Like, but, that, that, that didn't feel epic, like okay, now I finally want, I want, building the village church or something. Now I want to ask, how do you get half a point? <laughs> it's literally written. Yeah. So, like, for example, linen is worth play. one point. But if you upgrade it, it's worth two and a half points. <laughs> it's super annoying when you're that, counting that, and then... That's very strange. I mean, I... I hit, like I, when you upgrade your clay to... No, no. no? When you upgrade your wood, wood? to timber. Yeah. Half right. a point. It's worth a half point. Just a half point. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he could have he could have just doubled everything. Yeah, exactly. And then when you upgrade clay to brick, it's half a point. Yeah. And it's just, it's annoying. It's I don't know why he didn't just give one point. And Dima, two. every single game we play, her points end with 0.5. <laughs> every time. <laughs> oh. All in all, though, my thoughts, I know I mean, if Dima wants to do a final thoughts as well, I think this is one of the better Uwe Rosenberg games I've ever played. And to tell you guys what happened, this game has been on our table for the last week and a half. Yeah. We play the game. At the end of it, we set it up again for the next game, and then we leave it there. And then whenever we feel like playing, we go downstairs, we play the game, and then we just set it up again to start. So nothing else has been on our table for the last 10 days because we just keep playing the game and setting it up again for the next play. So I feel like Ipo. <laughs> yeah, but is it, is it because... owning a board game table oh. is the best. <laughs> oh, okay. Is it because it's convenient or is it because it's a big hassle to uh, take it away and then set it up again? It's, it's not that big a hassle because I arranged it that like I put all the starting materials for each person in its own bag and stuff. So it's actually not that hard to set up. I, mm. I will say the setup is not that bad. Mm. Um, it's more like we knew that this was the only thing we were going to play that week. We, we, we were very happy playing the game. Yeah. And you know me. When I play one, a game once, I don't want to see it again for six to eight months. You know what I mean? <laughs> but you're playing and this again and again. Thank you, Elias. Again come, and again. come to the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> So I think it's a very good game. I think it's mm, I think it's my favorite over Rosenberg. Uh, obviously behind ben Bonanza. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if it's not my favorite, it's up there as one of my favorites. And I highly recommend it. I'd like to try it solo and report back at some point. Dima? I agree. It's, it was a really, really good experience. Honestly, for a two-player Euro, it was it was such a good design because um, usually Euros are four players. And so this was very strange, but it was it was a good experience altogether. Okay. I really Dima, enjoyed Dima, it. When, I'm, when I usually say this was a very good experience and a very good design, I don't really like the game. <laughs> so, I mean, maybe it was a good experience and a very good design, but yeah, it's not for me. Like... <laughs> It was a good design, a good experience, and 
I recommend the game. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now, now we're I, talking. I don't know about one player, but two players, it was really, really great. If you like worker placement, Euros, that kind of thing. And it's a Fa- perfect farming. game for, for COVID days because we can't, it's two players. So. <laughs> and, and it's <laughs> outdoors. <laughs> and it's outdoors. It feels like you have some fresh air. <laughs> So that and was... you don't feel like anything's missing. So when you play other Euros, like when we play La Granja, I do feel like Elias doesn't like the length of the game at four players, but I like the amount of interaction at four players. And this game, you don't feel like it's missing anything. So that's what I like the most. Missing friends. <laughs> <laughs> and that was Fields of Arl by Uwe Rosenberg. So Elias, the guy that sold to you, he had a problem making it fit. <laughs> yeah, he did. <laughs> well, when you're a big lad like myself, we tend to always look for things that fit. Because, let's be honest, <laughs> there's not many places out there with with stuff that fits us. <laughs> Luckily, the guys over at Wormwood have solved that problem. Woo-hoo! They are announcing a second <laughs> Kickstarter for a gaming table. And that will satisfy all your size requirements. <laughs> <laughs> they have a four-player table, a six-player table, and an eight-player table. What's interesting is they are offering the first 100 backers free shipping. Well, well they're hoping to, I think. Well, they're hoping, but they probably will. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. Um, I think this is amazing. It, it, the Kickstarter is supposed to start on August 4th. Hey folks, Future Elias here from the Editing Bay. It's actually been pushed back to August 11th. So not August 4th, but August 11th. I don't know if everyone listening knows who Wormwood is, but they are the absolute platinum standard in quality when it comes to woodworking in the hobby gaming industry. So they only use premium woods. Like the, the cheapest wood they offer is cherry which is nicer than what my board gaming table is made of, right? And that's the lowest end that they offer. You're not getting pine. On top of that, they offer all sorts of expensive stuff, but like really good quality, Purple Heart, uh, Bolivian Rosewood, all sorts of Makassar Ebony, gorgeous woods. And in, in general, they never like stain their woods. I think they're offering one stained wood for the first time, but they, they do everything basically by hand. And then they just coat it in like a wax. And it's just gorgeous, gorgeous work. They use these rare earth magnets and all their stuff to keep everything together. Basically, it's the highest standard. They actually have something called the Craftsman's Promise, which is at any point in time during your life, if anything breaks, your fault or their fault, they'll fix it for you. So if you buy a dice vault from them and you th- you accidentally drop it on your, off the table, and for some reason, it lands on something and smashes. You can tell them it's my fault. Send it to them, and they'll pay for. They'll they'll fix it for free. So, that's wow. that's somebody who stands behind their product. So, wow, Wormwood is phenomenal, and they already have a gaming table, a couple of gaming tables, the Prophecy and the Sojourn. But they're the more expensive table, and I think the idea of this one is they're hoping to start like the four player gaming table in Cherry at like seven hundred and fifty bucks which is incredibly low. And I know they want to get their coffee tables because they're also doing coffee tables for less than 750 bucks. This is amazing. I mean, you're, you're, when it comes to quality, don't even worry about it. Wormwood has got you covered and it's a, it's a great way to get a a board game table. Like I, I, if I didn't have my board game table, I would completely jump Uh, in there. You know what I like about these guys is that they're making these videos. So if you go to Kickstarter and, uh, and b- <laughs> and back this probably you're gonna see like your table uh, under the process of making it uh, during the uh, uh, uploading of videos in YouTube. And I know that uh, you know us people who watch their their show Worm Life, we're, we're called Wormlings. <laughs> Basically, I know that they're uh, if you watch the show, they're giving like a heads up and stuff of of when the, the Kickstarter is coming out. So good time to go watch their show, get get in, binge it. Um, and it's it's really a very entertaining show on YouTube. But I, th- I think this is awesome. August 4th Kickstarter. August 11th. Honestly, one thing I really liked about their designs is they engrave their logo on the side of the table. And their logo is beautiful. It, it looks like a tree inside a shield. 
but it's obviously it's words it's their the name of their company but it's really nice it's you, like you aesthetically beautiful what? you missed something what's at the center of that tree a sword yeah oh nice it's a nice so touch it's a sword growing in the center of a wormwood tree inside a shield it's really beautiful <laughs> and the way they engrave it into the wood it's it's really nice i i love that touch yeah so that's my two cents yeah i mean i'd sell my kidney to buy one of the things <laughs> <laughs> and, okay. and then we ship it to south africa so <laughs> I just I just buy it and send it to Elias and be like Elias, this is yours now until I can get it. I'll ship it to you one piece at a time. Yeah. And I know they're offering a bunch of things you can add on because they have like a rail system that runs around. It's a magnetic rail system that runs on the inside and the outside of the top of the table. So you have the usual stuff like uh, cup holders and um, bit trays and stuff. But they're adding some new stuff, which is they're doing. Um, like a like a shelf for like a DM that can stick out, and they're also doing uh, these like little charge packs. So like they're these wireless things you can plug in off to the side. You just connect them, put your phone on it, and they wirelessly charge your phones. So th they've got a lot of cool stuff that you can optionally add on. And because the starting price is so low for a gaming table, um, I think I think that uh, you can really get the table that you want out of this Kickstarter. So check it out. Uh, supposed to start on August 4th. For God's sakes, it's the 11th. All right, guys. So, in the past few weeks, I was playing a six-player game. Did I invite five people at my house to play? No, that would be illegal. <laughs> <laughs> I, was I was playing Downforce in Board Game Arena. Downforce is a racing game like every other except it's not because in downforce your main goal is not to come first but to make the most profit players start the game with a hand of cards and in the beginning there's an auction the players bid to own the six cards of the game and then in turn order they play one of their gar cards moving their car but also moving their opponent's cards oh amazing because mm. the the card has like Two to actually one to six different colors, and it shows next to each color a number. And then, if you mm -hmm. play this card, you need to move, let's say, the orange card five spaces, the blue card four spaces, and uh, so forth and so, so on. Mm -hmm. So it's camel up with cards instead of dice. Uh, I didn't want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> You've been playing a lot of car games recently, Ipo. It's because uh, he's not allowed to drive anywhere because of quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> You're you're right. Card games? What other card games do they play? What do you know? Card. Card, ah, card games. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what noise do they make, Tima? <laughs> I don't know it's, what kind of card Tima is driving. It's the Tesla. Is it the Tesla? Our, our, our Tesla is not too good. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the, the electricity. The charger. It's a charger. Oh. Okay, so in turn, uh, sorry, uh, during the race, the players make secret bets on who is going to win. The winner is the player with the most money from prize money plus winning bets minus the initial auction money they spent. And that's I the whole mean, thing. I, mean, I, I make secret bets on who's going to win Game Show of the Week, which is why I was so mad last week when <laughs> you tried to steal it from me. <laughs> there, there's a huge gambling circle on the TTS uh, sub forum that you guys don't know about. <laughs> wow. The dark web. The dark web. We only oh. bet in Bitcoin. <laughs> Elias, Elias, of course I know about it. That's why I'm losing every episode. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, you're going down in the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, pros and cons of this game. It's the quickest racing game satisfaction I've ever had because it's actually the quickest game that we can play with uh, six players. Uh, and... Quicker, sorry, the quickest racing game that you can play with six players. Every turn, playing the right card in order to block other cards and unblock yours is a mini puzzle. So there is a, a small strategy there. Uh, it's a great game to play both with your family, but also you can treat it as a party game with your friends. 
There's a Mario version of this game, apparently. Really? I didn't know that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there are pictures of it on BGG. Oh, right. They even put, like, you know those those flowers that eat people along the I, track? I know there is the Danger Circuit expansion that adds two more tracks and new driver powers to the game. So mm-hmm. that's uh, one thing. And I was going to say... Wait, 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 wait. There's n- that, no, there isn't. <laughs> Why are there pictures of it on BGG? No, okay, so apparently... Um, is it a player? The miniatures from Monopoly Gamer Mario Kart Edition are the same size as the race cars in Downforce. So oh. people have made cards that look like the cards from Downforce. Oh. And they're just using the pieces from Monopoly Gamer. <laughs> I was going to say, if that existed, we would own it. Because look at this. Yeah. <laughs> That's even funnier. I think yeah. we should get both games. <laughs> This, uh, this is the first thing that's made me want to play this game. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say it's also great with six players, which is unusual for this uh, count. I mean, you, you, it's, it's hard to find a game that plays well with six players. And going to the, uh, the less uh, uh, well-designed things, actually, it's not... It doesn't a, have any camels in it. <laughs> <laughs> it has a big portion of randomness. I'm going to say that, of course. And uh, also, there's only four tracks. Remember, we were talking last, uh, in the last episode about uh, Rallyman GT. It has like 30 tracks and it's a modular yeah. board. And you can build your own. Board, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, but I feel that uh, in this one, uh, they understood the problem. That's why they're uh, uh, going out now with the new expansions with uh, two more tracks. And uh, mm-hmm. in the first expansion, and two more in the new expansion. So I think uh, we should try it uh, all together at some point in BGH. Uh, I don't feel it's a good game to play turn based because the whole point is, you know, the, the fun, the party. Didn't uh, we all play it at did- Essen a couple of years ago? Except Dima, obviously. Oh, I remember I played it with uh, Dimitris and Evi and Byron. Yeah. Yeah, and I think yeah. I, I played it with Eugenio, what? Hamad, and AK, I think. So, so do you guys I feel like this that. game is for your... <laughs> do you guys feel like either. this game I is for so. your age group? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, for me, yes. <laughs> okay. Oh, wait, wait, are okay. we talking mental age or actual age? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's... Okay, it's a betting game, so you can say it's for uh, adults, right? At the same mm-hmm. time... It's it's easy, so you can play it with your family. It's a family game. You you won't you you won't play it as a st- strategic racing game. Like it's not like Grand mm-hmm. Prix, not even like uh, Rallyman. I think the comparison should be Camel Up and not those two. Exactly. So exactly. That's my question. You played Camel Up, correct? Yes. Um, is it yep. Camel Up or Camel Cup? It's Camel Up. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you would have been replaced by Kevin. Uh, so would you say this was a fun game? Wait, I had a question. That wasn't my actual question. <laughs> Which would you rather play, Downforce or Camel Up? I'd rather play Downforce. Okay. Is the reason because cause the one thing I can see other than the... I love the theme of Camel Up, but the one thing that I can see that's very interesting is in Camel Up, you're just shaking the pyramid and then dropping a dice to see which camel is moving. In this game, you're more like you actually are involved in how the cars move. Yeah. With your choice in cards, so it seems more deterministic in that regard than than Camelot. Is that an accurate assessment? Yes. Yes. You have the cards from the beginning of the of the game, so you can. Not, I cannot say you can predict who's gonna win, but you have at least some data to assess what's going on i mean it's it's really a better game it's designed by rob davio and uh, uh i think it's based on the design of by wolfgang kramer big names of uh design have uh put uh, some thought on this and it really works it, it's smooth and for what it is it's uh, uh it's great and i want to uh, respond to dima she asked if, if it was fun i felt that the the most fun in the in this game is to block the other players. I mean, to to just go ahead of them and block them 
and then they cannot play and then they're shouting and the fun and uh, laughing and uh, <laughs> mean things okay. uh, I, I, are I believe this game was a re-implement of a game called Top Race from 1996 which was the Wolfgang Kramer game. and that was Downforce speaking of games that are fun <laughs> don't expect any coming from the guys over <laughs> at Verona <laughs> Games because that's not what they believe in <laughs> <laughs> Tell us more, Byron. <laughs> Tell us more about that. Shit. Oh In a recent interview, the designer of Root, Cole, Cole, I can't say his surname right. Is it really? Whirl, whirl, really? 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 <laughs> ha- it stated pretty, pretty blatantly that he's not trying to make a fun game. <laughs> fun to him is a meaningless concept. He wants to make a good game. I th- I think he misses the point. Games can be fun and good. <laughs> well, no, I think I don't think he said he wants to make a not fun game. I think his idea is the game that is fun. The, the concept of fun deter- it depends on the person. So he's not trying to make a fun game. He's trying to make a good game because that's all he can make. The actual quote was: "Whenever I am working at Leader, we have friends in." We have friends in or people are visiting or working on games. If ever people start talking about fun or feel bad, I'm like, no, you can't use those words <laughs> because they're not trying to make the game fun. We are not trying to make the game fun. <laughs> I know. I didn't say it was German. I meant something else. Anyway, we're trying to make the game good. So fun to me is this word that doesn't really mean anything. Games have this massive emotional range. Why would you want to make a game just about the giggles? You could do that too, but when you're optimizing for it, you've got to remove a lot of the character for the. Oh my god! No, 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 guys, oh guys! Oh my god! This really like you're, makes you, you mi- not want to play his next game. No, no, like, you are missing. Is- no, no, you are missing the point in what he said. I mean, his idea is that you you need to leave a roller coaster. Of emotions, that, that's that's the idea that you're gonna feel no, bad. No, you're not allowed you're... to have certain emotions. You cannot say fun or feel bad. He says no. You cannot <laughs> use those words. <laughs> 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 Look, I totally get what he's I saying. I think he's really not gonna like and our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> to do even more fan service, I don't really care about the market. People who like the game, I don't care. I only, I only care about. How Drew and I feel about the game. <laughs> uh, well, listen, we love Coverly oh, on do. this podcast. I mean, Fox Premier is one of our favorite games. Uh, John Company is one of our favorite yeah. games. It was on our top 20. Yeah. And Root is a game that we gave a po- po- very positive review. We had a few criticisms, but we gave a positive review to, and we gave that game away. Shout out, Board Game Guru. How you doing, buddy? <laughs> so, <laughs> so um uh the point of, of this is we we really like go early and this is not going to stop me from wanting to play his game i just think it's hilarious <laughs> <laughs> because it is, it is especially if you read it like you did <laughs> <laughs> because okay so my favorite designer is vlada Shvatel, huge surprise and i think what i like about him is he his games have a joie de vivre. Like th- there's a there's joy in the game. You know, Galaxy Trucker and Space Alert are based on joy and fun. Mage Knight is a very heavy game, but the game itself is literally about playing with action figures. You know what I mean? Like, yes, yeah. there's puzzle solving, but the cool thing about it is using your knight to storm the castle. You know, have fun storming the castle. And even through the ages. That is most serious game. There's a lot of fun elements to through the ages. The the way that combat works, the way that you have to declare war and then wait around, and then you're both sort of in a mad rush for military in that <laughs> round. Like there's there's a there's a lot of fun to his game. And would you say that those are not good games? Like it's... no, but Elias, when you're storming a castle, you're killing people. Maybe it shouldn't be fun. <laughs> <laughs> This is the wrong emotion to feel. <laughs> okay, well, that I, being I, said, I, I just have okay. Go ahead. Sorry, they're bringing out a game called Oath. Yeah, and it's, it sounds a bit about time travelly and a bit cool. 
Uh, but you know what I think when I read the description? It what? sounds fun. <laughs> Do you not use those words? <laughs> <laughs> you can use those words. He just doesn't care. <laughs> no, no. He wrote here. This is a quotation. Yeah. No. If you're a, that's if you are. You a can't play tester. use those words. <laughs> if you are a play tester. But if you're actually. Oh one my of... goodness. Okay. So so one more point. This is the last point I want to make. I'll leave you guys to this. Um, he talks about Sierra Madre games, which again, I don't know if you guys know. Huge fans of Pax Porfiriana, Pax Premier, Pax Renaissance, one of our favorite games. You know, we're, we're fans. He, they, they talk about Sierra Madre and they said, that's why him and his brother, why you and I both look up towards that, what Sierra Madre has made. Sierra Madre, and I love their games, please don't take this the wrong way, do not make good games. Th their games are not designed well. Period. The games are the closest thing you can find to simulation. So in, in Sierra Madre, the historical accuracy is more important than the actual gameplay. And you know that because when you try to read a rule book, the first 20 pages of Neanderthal are scientific history. Then, he, then you get to page 20 and then he says, set up, okay? So my point is, it's all based on accuracy and historical accuracy, and then the game is molded to fit that. And they are not elegant games. They're clunky, they are, but they are so good. Because for me, they're fun. They're a lot of yeah. fun. So you look up to Sierra Madre, and then you say, what we're trying to do is make good games. Sierra Madre, by definition, does not make good games. They make games for people that are almost zealots in their belief that what they want is an accurate historical game. Like me. No, I, I wouldn't agree with that. I mean, they are doing, as you say, accurate historical games, but at the same time, the design is, is good. Uh, it's, it's well designed. Maybe the components are very bad and the rules that, are that, very That's bad. untrue. That's untrue. Because if you look at something like Pax Porfiriana, okay, and you think about the fact that the way that you build your tableau, um, the cubes basically have multiple functions depending on what kind of card that they're on but even among the same kind of card the cubes can have different functions depending on what part of the card that they're on and these cubes can be moved by literally like touching the table or the fact that um th the game itself is clunky oh it's yeah like the guy I, was, I, I totally agree with that but the mechanism is amazing i, don't I think mean it, it's not it, elegant no if you can you, can you the, teach can the, you teach pax perforiana to somebody and just rely on their natural logic to understand the game. Or Pax Renaissance. Or Pax Renaissance. <laughs> the game is completely unapproachable, but it's fucking brilliant. Yeah, but if you want to say that something is historically accurate, but not a good game, I think you should look at GMT games. Very true. But, but I'm not saying, I'm not, this is not mutually exclusive of one or the other, but okay. I'm not saying they're not good games. I guess that's the wrong thing. I'm saying they're not good designs. Like, the game is amazing. The design it feels secondary. Not streamlined, let's say. Not streamlined, yes, maybe? Yes, there's no streamlining whatsoever. I guess you look at it and you say, if you're trying to make a good game, is this your model? Because I find them fun. I find Cole Verley's games fun. But your definition of a good game, is that a well-designed game? Because then you're sort of using the wrong example here. So, I don't know, whatever it is, I thought it was an interesting conversation. So... I wanted our listeners to let us know what they think about not being allowed to say fun game. <laughs> what do you guys think? I think it was really very interesting interview and uh, hilarious at the same time, as you say. So <laughs> let's have let's have a link somewhere so the uh, the listeners can go in. Absolutely, it'll be in the it'll be in the in the episode description. I did I did understand one place he was coming from when he was saying, for us we like thinking about a game after we play it and understanding why this person lost versus why he won versus so they really like the like game designs and i guess that's why they're in this business i just for me it has to ha come hand in hand with emotions like fun or feel bad i i i don't want to separate those two things and uh i guess yeah that's that's how I feel, but um, 
to each his own. I guess if that's the way they <laughs> like to look at games and that's how they think they're, they're going to keep designing better games, doing it this way and thinking about games critically and yeah, just engineering wise, then I guess, uh, yeah. Byron? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they're forgetting the second word of board games, which is game. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite line is, why would you want to make a game just about the giggles? <laughs> yeah, just, just about the giggles? <laughs> I think they took fun to the extreme. <laughs> like... <laughs> no, you're not having fun the right way, Dima. <laughs> you can't play cops and robbers when you're all cops. <laughs> We're just kidding, Cole. We love you. Um, we, we love just, your games. We love your games. Yeah, we do. And we, th we think they're really fun. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just a very interesting article, but it is a good article. And it's not just that. I feel like the interviewer did a very good job with their questions as well. Yeah. So yeah, shout totally. out to dicebreaker.com. And we'll leave a link to this interview. You guys check it out and tell us what you think. And now it's time for the game show of the week, baby. Yeah. I promise not to get mad this time. <laughs> Pinky finger. Pinky promise. Pinky swear. Four seconds and we'll watch them fall. What stands in the way of winning and we'll smoke them all is their lack of intellect and a savoir faire about the hobby of board games they claim they're aware. Folks, Dima here. <laughs> 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 okay, it's not Dima. This is Hippocrates. And this wow. week. Oh, no, no, you really had me there. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, this week I'm going to ask you to tell me items from a list relevant to our Tabletop Sessions Top 20 games. Oh, shit. And yes. to be more okay. specific, games that you all three voted for. Oh, oh shit. no. For <laughs> I can't even remember what wait, I wait, wait. This remember. doesn't include you, Ipo? For no, it doesn't include me. Just the three of you. Okay. Okay. So, for example, Spyfall okay. locations. That could be one of the questions. It's not. So, after telling you the question, I'm going to say a player's name. That player has four seconds to give me one item of the list. After four seconds, I'm going to say the next player's name, who again has four seconds to say an item or pass and so on. So you all three are playing one after the other. Is it clear? Yeah. Kind of. <laughs> I, d I don't see you excited. I'm, not, I don't <laughs> well, I'm, I'm very never, excited I've been, about this. I've been very nervous ever since you said you wanted to host Game Show. <laughs> I, I'm, so, I'm still confused from when you said you were Dima. <laughs> <laughs> because you, you're not Dima. <laughs> Because you're not Dima. Okay. So why would you why would you say that? Dima has what curly you, hair. It was a bad job. Yeah, it was a bad job. <laughs> please edit it. Please edit it. Okay. So guys, I'm continuing with the rules. If you, if all three of you oh give God. me three, how many rules are there? It's just, okay, it's just, it's just if you give me three consecutive wrong answers or no answers, the clock stops and we move on to the next did question. You did you design this game with Cole Worley? <laughs> <laughs> because it sounds like it's not gonna have very much fun in it. <laughs> yes, it's not about fun, guys. It's about the quiz. It's about <laughs> what can I say? E even famous designers agree with me. Anyway, so it's that it's item that you discover gives you one point. Okay. The two okay. play the two players with the most points in the end of the sixth question are going on to the final seventh question. Wow, you think we're gonna last? That's six a lot questions. of questions. Bro. Okay, let's do this it. Let's do it. I long. like this, Ipo. You have faith in us. <laughs> so, ready to go. Question one. Wait, wait who started? Who starts? Randomly, randomly, I made, I uh, uh, decided that we are starting with Dima, then Byron, yes. then Elias. It's, That's it, fine. As it, long as I'm not. Yes, yeah, so it feels totally random. It's not. <laughs> It's not actually random. It's the reverse order of uh, who won the most uh, game shows of the week. Okay, so okay. Elias is the, the top winner and he goes last. He, okay. He, he just Epo gives you question. a chance. So you're going to ask one question and then I'm going to answer it first. 
then Byron, then Alice. Like it's the same question. You're not going to ask yes. them a and different question. Exactly. Does it go back to Dima? And it goes back to Dima. Yes. Okay. The same question. The same question. Yes. We're going to keep. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna. Okay. I'm gonna say your name. Okay. So there are yes. 14 factions in this classic game, voted 15th in our top 20. Dima, please tell me a faction of Terra Mystica. The clock starts now. Witches. Dima, witches. Byron. Dwarves. Elias. Giants. Damn it. Giants. Dima. <laughs> Uh, 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 alchemist, I don't know. Yes, <laughs> alchemist, <laughs> correct. Alchemist. Byron. Celtis. Celtis, correct. Elias. Darkling. Correct. Oh, Darklings. Dima. <laughs> I can't. I, I'm, I'm done. Byron. Mer, mer people. Merfolk, mermen, uh, whatever. Mermaids. Identify themselves as. Correct. Elias. Engineers. Engineers, correct. Dima. Oh, it's back to me? I don't know anymore, <laughs> so skip me. <laughs> Byron. Uh, uh, <laughs> Elias. <I don't> <laughs> Fakirs. Yes, Fakirs, yeah, correct. Racist. Back to Dima. I, I still don't know anymore. <laughs> Byron. Uh, fairies, I don't Elias. know. Elias! Gnomes. Nomads. <laughs> Nomads! Elias knows all of them. <laughs> Dima. I, I don't know. Byron. <laughs> so lost, okay, okay Dima and Byron, you can Google it now. Okay, Elias. <laughs> Oren. Oren, correct! And. I'm gonna Google it to see how many are left for Elias. Dima, this is you. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know anymore. <laughs> I don't know anymore. Elias? We got it's done. Uh, it's halflings. Good. Halflings, correct. Elias. <laughs> Chaos magician. I, I thought I had eight correct. Seconds. Dima. <laughs> Byron. No. I had like two seconds there and then it just went straight to Elias. Byron again? <laughs> no? Elias? No. Swarmling. You're not Googling. And fast that enough, was Byron. the last one. I, I got them all! Oh, <laughs> <laughs> was so... Oh my God. <laughs> At least my game stopped with the embarrassment. <laughs> like, this one was brutal. Uh, wait, what's on the other side of uh, Halflings? I wasn't... The other I brown one. The, uh, the cultists. No. Cultists. Oh, Byron okay. already said that. Okay, yeah. so... Okay. Uh, that was a disaster. Oh my God, you were going through the colors? Was, in yeah. Your, oh my God. <laughs> Guys, I played... I played Terroristica like 50. Yeah. <laughs> I was expecting actually something like that in the first question, but uh, Elias actually has nine <laughs> points. Three for Byron and two for Dima. That was not so bad. Okay, guys. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was really good. <laughs> so in the second question, you're going to go again from the player with the least uh, points. So Dima again goes first, then Byron, and then Elias. All right, Dima again. There are nine varieties of wine in the original Viticulture game, which was voted 13th in our top 20. <laughs> so you, just, you don't need even to remember the game. You just need to tell me a type of wine. Going. How many were there? Nine. Nine. No way. So, I can remember like... <laughs> Four, Let's maybe. start now. Red wine? Oh. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I haven't played that game in like five years. Have you ever drink <laughs> like say, wine? <laughs> you don't need to play it. It's just the same type of wine. Anyway, Byron. B Bordeaux? <laughs> I don't know. Pinot Noir? Pinot, correct. Elias. Merlot. Merlot, correct. Dima. Uh, Cabernet. <laughs> Cabernet, correct. Byron. Sauvignon Blanc. Byron, amazing. Are you reading, Byron? <laughs> you look like you're reading. <laughs> I feel like Byron Googled it. I feel like I, 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 know, I know too much about alcohol. Elias. Malbec. 
Melbourne. My hands are right here. Melbeck, uh, not in the uh, list. Oh, Riesling? Uh, Riesling? Uh, no. Uh, Dima. Oh, no. Dima. Okay. I don't know. Chardonnay? Nice. Chardonnay, nice. Dima, yes, correct. Byron. Uh, we've said Molo, haven't we? Yeah. Elias. I'm all out of wine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dima. Rosé. <laughs> Rosé. <laughs> it's not one. It's not one. <laughs> no. And the game is over three. Uh, no answers uh, in a row. And that was a disaster. you just didn't. F- Actually, you, you, you did pretty well. You just missed Syrah uh, and Shiraz. Trebbiano, Malvasia and Rosé Sangiovese. Rosé. Which was Malvasia. That's uh, the one I was thinking. Which, yeah, which yeah, was hard. When I, mm-hmm. when I said Malbec. <laughs> so Byron got two points. Dima got two points. And Telia's one. For a total. Oh, I thought you guessed more oh, that's than a that. Ca- Dima, we're catching up to Elias. Mm-hmm. Yeah, double his score this round. So now 10 points for Elias, five for Byron and four for Dima. And we're moving on to the... Third question. Oh, I'm f- I hope there's no disaster again here. This is a good game. <laughs> it's great. It's fun. Yeah. It's fun. So, Fantasy Flight Games made it to number 10 of our oh, top 20 no. with the epic third edition of Twilight Imperium. This for me oh, no. would be the. Please don't make This for this. me is the hardest question tonight. Dima, tell me one of the 17 factions of this. this Emirates of Hakan. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, yes, Emirates of Hakan, correct. Byron. Barony of Letnov. Correct. You're yeah. definitely reading. I can see you reading. I'm not reading. <laughs> Elias. Close your eyes, Byron. Close Universities your eyes. of Jolnar. Uh, Jolnar, correct. Dima. I can't remember anymore. <laughs> If, if, <laughs> if, if there's a tech guys. If, if you just find like, one yeah. of the one of the words in the title of of the what race. What kind of four seconds is this? <laughs> I will I will give it to you. Pass, pass, Ipo, pass. What kind of four seconds? Person. Byron. Isn't it the United Earth Nations or something? <laughs> uh, the humans. There's nothing like it, uh, sorry. Oh, Elias. Federation of Soul. Uh, that's Correct. It. Dima. What are those lizard people? <laughs> uh, I'm the, just going to wait out the, my four seconds. The Lizix. Yes, I will give it to you. She didn't say lizard. <laughs> she said lizard. Lizard. <laughs> Close enough. He, Byron. He was the judge. Wow. Uh, I'm going to pass. Elias. The extra yes. kingdoms. Oh, yeah. Okay. Correct. Dima. No, I'm done. Byron. Uh, I'm going to say the Embers of Muat. Nice. Yes, correct. Nice. Elias. Clan, Clan of Sar. Correct. Dima. Pass. <laughs> Byron. The Necrovirus. The one that has no other voting ability. Yes, correct. Byron, close your eyes. <laughs> Close them. No, keep I them closed. Right at the screen this keep time. them closed. Elias. Keep them closed. It's a real tribe. It's okay. Yeah. Guys, even I remember that. It's a real tribes. Dima. <laughs> he did not know that. Bo. Uh, I, no, I'm done. B- Byron. No, I'm done. That's a that's a for me. And Elias. Um I think I'm out. Um all right, That's guys. It. So Elias has one, two, three, four, five points from this game. Dima has two points. Not bad. And yeah, yeah, yeah could, lizard. <laughs> <laughs> and Byron has three points from this uh, question. So in total, Elias has fifteen points. Byron has eight points, and Dima has six. And we're going on to the fourth question. I am so stressed. <laughs> <laughs> I love this that. four seconds thing is really frustrating. <laughs> mm. Guys, characterized by some serious podcasters as one of the best games ever, GMT's Virgin oh Queen was sixth oh! <laughs> in our top 20. Dima, please tell me the name of one 
of the six powers of the game. Ottoman Empire? Correct! Byron. British Empire? Um, not accurate. Can you... No. Uh, then I'm going to change it to the Holy Roman Empire. Correct, Elias. England. <laughs> <laughs> Correct, okay. uh, Dima. Is the Protestants are in Correct. England? The Protestants. No. Byron. F France. France. Correct. And the last one. The most important is España. Spain. Sp <laughs> Sorry, guys, that's correct. And la the last one, I'm just laughing because I was ready to say, oh, Espana is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you would because it was me. So I was literally like, Espana. And I was like, don't do that. Don't do that. But Elias knows what a motherfucker I am. So he, <laughs> he, he did the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> now you just added two to your score. Can I just say how proud I am of you, Byron and Dima? We got all the virgin yeah, going here. Yeah. You guys honor my favorite game and i well, and i and i honor factions. you and i honor you because that's <laughs> up to you guys <laughs> so dima now has eight points byron has 10 and ellie has 17 and we're going to the fifth uh wild i would say question so in the game wild cutters ranked oh, no. 1299 in bgg and third in our top 20 of all time, there are, uh, listen now, okay. There are 14, Four companies. 14 locations de Whoa. depicted on a world map oh, where the players can build oil refineries. Mm -hmm. For each refinery, you need to give me just one of the countries that the refinery location covers. Uh, okay. 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 So approximately, right. if you remember where it is, and you say one okay. of the countries will be fine. Okay. Even okay. and even you can just throw countries in the air. Okay. Yeah. And hope for the best. Can we keep guessing during our four seconds until? No, you no, 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 right? no, no, no. Just one. You're gonna say. <laughs> just, <laughs> you're gonna say just, <laughs> just one. All right. Okay. Dima, ready? Yeah. yeah. Go. USA. USA. I don't remember how I have placed. It's in North America. <laughs> Ameri I don't know. America. Uh, it's you, sorry. Know. It's it's not. There's no refinery in the USA. Byron. What? Russia. Russia. Correct. Elias. Brazil. Brazil. Correct. Dima. Argentina. Argentina. No. Uh, Byron. Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is correct. Really? Elias. Canada. Canada is correct. Dima. Are there any countries in Africa? Nigeria? There's actually 50. Nigeria. Countries. No, I mean in the game. <laughs> Nigeria is correct. Uh, Byron. Oh, refinery. Australia. Australia yeah. is correct. There are two actually in Australia. I, I was thinking of the oil rig. Yeah. That's why the US. Yeah. Uh, Elias. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I, I don't know. China? China is correct. And Dima. Mm. Uh, Byron. Uh, uh, Venezuela. Venezuela, no. Elias. Uh, Finland. <laughs> Finland, no. So, so now we have uh, three nog in a row, yes. <laughs> so it was Mexico, guys. It was just. In between, oh, in between, it. and there is one in Peru. Okay. I was laughing because there is w one in Norway and Sweden. That's what I was thinking of. But not, <laughs> and one in Russia, but not in Finland. And I was random. There is one more in South Africa, Byron. Oh, oh. No, no, no. Barizi, that's on you. <laughs> and that was going to be my next guess. And the <laughs> Who was <it>? you, <laughs> And the last one that covers... My, my, my next was going to be Mexico, then Norway. <laughs> <laughs> and the last one that covers UK and France. Okay. Okay, so... Oof. 
It, that was hard. So, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. So Elias got three of them. Byron got three of them to third. Elias to in 20 points now. 13 points for Byron and to, uh, nine, nine points for Dima. I can get to 10. I feel it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's a good thing there's another three rounds. So that's, a, <laughs> that's the last round before the final. Leaders are an important I, I have a question. Yes. The final, oh, no. only the winner of the final wins, or are we just adding points? No, the winner of the final wins. Okay, so even if I'm up by like 50 points, if that, the final comes yeah. and I, I lose by one point, I've lost. Yes. Then what's the point of playing the whole game? But if, I really don't know. But, but if you are first, you're going to choose if you're going to play first or second. Okay. <laughs> okay, but I'm not going to beat Elias at this one. So leaders yeah, are, you are. are an important aspect of Vlada Tsvatil's famous game I through the ages, him. a story of civilization <laughs> I don't know ranked second. Wait, the new one or the old one? A story of civilization. Are going to go through leaders? So story or a new story? The, the story, so the, the old one. So the old one, okay. Ranked second in our top 20. So Dima, let's start with you. Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar, correct. Byron. Homer. Homer, correct. Elias. Moses. Moses, correct. Guys, you're amazing. Dima, sorry. Gen Genghis Khan. Gen Genghis Khan, correct. Uh, Byron. Game designer. That's correct. How do you remember that? That's oh, they replaced him with Sid Meier, I think. In the yes, yeah. correct. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Elias. Maximilian Robespierre. Correct, Dima. I think I'm done. Byron. Either rockstar or musician. I love that you're going for generic. Rockstar. Rock, yeah. rock I've never seen these. Is it me? Elias. Uh, Napoleon. Oh, Napoleon. 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 Dima, you just need to tell me historical figures, like anybody. Dima. Um, 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 Famous no, historical no. figures. No, I, <laughs> okay, Byron. Uh, James Cook. Nice. James Cook, correct. Elias. I don't remember any of Joan these of Arc. characters. Joan of Arc, correct. Dima. <laughs> Louis XIV. <laughs> <laughs> the Sun King. Good. <laughs> That's a good try. Try. Okay, try harder <laughs> next time, Byron. <laughs> I want to say Saladin. No, but good. But that nah. was a good choice, Elias. Einstein. Einstein, oh. correct. Dima. Uh, Hannibal. Hannibal. Wait, Hannibal. I'm just trying. No, I'm just no trying. Hannibal. There's no Hannibal. No. Okay. Um, Byron. I'm out of ideas. Um, Elias. I don't know. Um. All right, so Dima got one, two, three, three points. Byron got one, two, three, four points. And Elias got one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four points also. So the, f the results before the final is uh, Elias 24, Byron 17, and Dima 12. Woohoo! Yeah! <laughs> Dima! Congratulations <laughs> to everybody and uh, congratulations even more to the two finalists that are going to our seventh. What is this that? is the longest game show of the week. <laughs> <laughs> it's super fun though. It is a lot of fun. To the seventh. Ooh, can't use those words. Seventh <laughs> question. <laughs> Let's go to the seventh and final questions, guys. Are you ready? Sure. I'm ready. I'm tired. In Joseph Fatula's Living Earth, our favorite game of all time, <laughs> there are 10 technologies for the players to discover. Five of them, I'm, I'm going to give you a hint, five of them are rockets or thrusters. Okay. Elias, would, you, would yeah. you like to go first or second? First. Okay, Alice goes first, and the clock starts now. Uh, Saturn. Saturn, correct. 
Byron. Sputnik. <laughs> Sputnik. N- I don't know. No, Elias. Um, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, re-entry. Uh, re- 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 re-entry. I'm gonna give it to you. Okay. Byron. <laughs> no, Elias. Life support. Life support. Correct, Byron. I played this game five years ago. Okay. <laughs> Elias. Apollo. No, when the game ends and Elias is the big winner. Was it, what's the other rocket? Oh, Soyuz. Soyuz. That's the one. Okay, so you okay. Mi- guys, you missed Juno, Atlas, Soyuz. Uh, you found Saturn, Iron Thrusters. Oh, Iron Thrusters. Yeah. Uh, surveying. Rendezvous, Byron. I thought you were gonna find rendezvous, and landing. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and landing. Okay, just to remind you that all these games were voted by you as your <laughs> favorite games of all time. Yeah, I didn't vote for it because I knew what the cards said. <laughs> Nobody yeah, said. Yeah, what so. I love about Through the Ages is uh, knowing all the leaders. <laughs> Nobody said so. Congratulations, guys. That was amazing. I love, Byron, that you got all the, like, rock star game <laughs> designer. <laughs> it's so good. Oh, man, I forgot Gandhi on that one. Yeah. Oh, it's oh, Gandhi. Yeah. Can't be attacked. Yeah. There were so many. Well, you I, can. I didn't, it just cost double the action. Time. I didn't want to mention, but true. there were so many that you didn't mention in uh, Through the Ages, like Hammurabi, Aristotle, Alexander the Great, Michelangelo, oh Leonardo da Vinci, Christopher. Yes, but we said we said Louis XIV. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, Christopher and, Colombo. And he was the Sun King, <laughs> <laughs> the guy that discovered the Americas. Christopher Columbus. We, he did not discover the Americas. <laughs> we he let, found. He, he, we're not. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not getting into this, but I hate. That. Okay. <laughs> Uh, William Shakespeare. Uh, I just want to say, with only one European in this podcast, we don't say Christopher Columbus discovered oh the God. America. Oh my goodness, <laughs> I wanted to say Shakespeare, and then I was like, no way, no way. Like, your memory is tricking I, I you. I thought Byron already got him because he said rock star, and Shakespeare was a rock star. Shakespeare. <laughs> uh, Bach. Bach was there. Bach is one. Oh, right, he oh. sucks. Yeah. Isaac Newton. He's only good if you have like a ton of multimedia. <laughs> Isaac Newton, Mahatma Gandhi, okay, we're done. Ni- we're done. Nikolai we're Tesla, li- and Winston- we're losing listeners by the second. <laughs> and Winston Churchill. At this rate, we're losing hosts. Winston, <laughs> oh, Winston Churchill. Wow. Oh my God. That's bad. Uh, yeah. That was exhausting. Guys, do you guys hear? You guys hear that? That was exhausting. Guys. Sounds a bit. Sounds a bit. De- well done, Ippo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was a great, a great game. Amazing. I think you did a very good job. You stressed the shit out of all of us. <laughs> if you're looking f- for for making a good game and not a fun game, you hit the nail on the head. <laughs> it I'm wasn't fun. I was so sweating. stressed. Yeah, <laughs> so, literally. I, I'm right. sweating. <laughs> oh, so well done, Ippo. I'll let you host it again sometime. I'm proud of you. Maybe another after two years again. <laughs> no, I think I think every few episodes you get one. You did a great oh, job. Thank you. Well, it depends how well Dima does on this next section, because guys, it's time for the Democratic Corner. Yay! 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 Guys, welcome to the Democratic Corner, where everyone has a say. <laughs> Today, oh, we're going to discuss nice. top three deductive reasoning games. So in order for Ipo not to be able to put Avalon as his top one, top two, top three, <laughs> everything, we're not doing social deduction games. So deductive reasoning games. And who would like to start? I'll go first. Okay, Byron. So, I try to make sure that I follow the rules to the T, <laughs> which is pretty hard since some of my favorite deduction games are like Secret Hitler, Spyfall, all of those sort of <laughs> games. But I couldn't pick him. Thanks, Seema. You're welcome. <laughs> in, 
<laughs> Instead, I had to pick my number three, Not Alone. Nice. I, have, oh. I haven't played it a lot, so it can definitely drop out of my top three at any point. It's very interesting because there's only deduction for like one player. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's but that's that's the fun. Like you as the survivors are trying to hide as well. So you got to try and think where he thinks you're going to think. I feel like that's more of like a bluffing game, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that's why it's his number three. <laughs> that's what's my, yeah, that's why it's my it's number a, three. It's in the deduction category. Let's put it this way. <laughs> what? I'm not and the I... next one, you guys are going to probably feel the same way. <laughs> it's Tragedy Looper. Yeah. Good game. Yeah. A solid game. No, great. Most confusing rules of any game ever. Game. it's not not easy to learn yeah but it's very very intricate and very good at what it does and the fact that you have to keep replaying scenes to solve the situation yeah i love it i think it has one of the most unique deductions like i really respect the deduction in that game because every time you teach the game to anyone the first time around they look at you like this doesn't make any sense <laughs> then by <laughs> by loop three they are making connections they didn't realize could be made with how because it's a weird it's like four levels of deduction it's like it's, it's a light bulb moment game yeah it's like if he's doing this action then this must be this subplot if it's this subplot then the subplot must be part of this major plot if that's part of this major plot then his goal must be to do this so then if his goal is to do this then he wants to do this and who's the person of interest and then we gotta stop so it's, <laughs> it's so <laughs> and, and i love the fact that you can go through all of this in your head yeah but your friend sitting next to you it could be going through a completely different set Very of rules true. on there Very oh true. but he's going there okay so maybe i can go there then yeah i, us and I like, usually go all this understand. thought process in my head but the last word is unless <laughs> <laughs> so that's my number two good Tragedy choice. Looper good choice my number one is a game I had a quite a lot of fun playing and that's The Shipwreck Arcana nice oh that's a very good one very nice good choice very good game very good and good choice you, got, you guys have to work together to to sort of figure out what's being said I, I enjoy it the code yeah. yeah it's fun that it's a co-op and a deduction game yeah. Because like, um, and the best thing about Shipper Arcana is if you're just trying to deduce, oh, what does that clue say? You will never win the game. But when you get to the point that it's not just what did that clue say and why didn't he pick any of the other clues? Nice choice. And that's my top three. Nice. So, Ipo, you want to no, go? I'd next? like to yeah. jump in. Yeah, okay. Because um, I have some crossover. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, my number three is cryptid so uh, um yeah i was sure it was gonna be there a, it's a game about you have a map a unique map and the game like by itself generates a basically when you build a map it gives each person one clue a different clue and based on the way the map is built plus all four clues or however many players you are clues when you just sort of cross those things together it comes out that only a single location on the map could possibly have the cryptid that you're looking for. So the game itself is quite genius because of the way that it builds that AI into the game with those clues. And as the game plays, you're basically asking questions. Oh, is this here? And then everyone says it could be. And then one person's like, no, it can't. And then you start to build patterns. Well, Epo says, no, it can't every time it's next to water. So I know it's not next to water. And then eventually you're able to narrow it down to one single location it's an excellent game uh Ipo, you played it what do you think uh um, i think it's like my third favorite game in this category <laughs> <laughs> all right moving on um my number two is the shipwreck arcana and we've already talked about this barnes number one excellent choice um i really enjoy that game it's one of the few co-ops i really really love and remember last time we talked about co-ops and I didn't put it on there because I wanted to put it on for deduction because it's more a deduction game than a co-op game. And my number one is Zendo. It's not technically deduction. It's more inductive reasoning, but that's really picking hairs. So in Zendo, uh, the master has a rule and they need to create structures that follow that rule. So in the beginning, they create one structure that follows that rule and one structure that doesn't follow that rule. 
And then everyone goes around, they build a structure, and they ask, does this follow the rule? And you're trying to figure out what the rule is. And the rule could be something as simple as it has to have exactly two yellow pieces. Or it can be something like um, the number of yellow pieces, uh, number of yellow squares does never increases the number of any other square of any other color. You know, so it can get a bit confusing. And there's different levels to the game. But man, I love this game. We don't really, I mean, we, we give points in the sense that if you get it right, you get the card. But we don't play for points. Nobody cares. We, we play, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no one cares. We just really enjoy <laughs> playing Zendo. It's, it's, and it's, that's my number one. Uh, Ipo, you want to go next? Yes. Uh, I, I'm so sorry. You've been trying to <laughs> go since we started. Okay. Go ahead. So I have some crossovers now. Uh, first of all, I would like to start with a disclaimer. Uh, when I filtered out uh, deduction games and the games I have already rated in uh, BGG, Zendo didn't come out. So it's one of the best games out there, but it's not in my top three. Probably it would have been if it was uh, filtered out, but I don't know what happened. I will look at it. <laughs> in my ex And speak to the BGG admin. Uh, speak to my secretary. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you, but it was on the link that Dima sent. Ooh, oh. I sent <laughs> so my number three uh, best deduction game, not Avalon, is <laughs> Cryptid. Okay, it's as Elia said, it's an amazing game. I don't want to uh, say anything on top of this. Uh, my number two is Captain Sonar. I think... The problem with Captain Sonar is that it's an excellent game for eight players. And for me... It, it's also not a deduction game. <laughs> there's, there's a dedu yeah, deduction piece with like the battleship it's not side the, it's of not it. It's not deduction. You're just drawing the map. Guys, it's... And then you're, yeah, you're, 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 you're running the, the clear paper over the map to see if it fits. By that logic, That's you deduction. Said okay, deduction. I, I'm going yeah. to say it's in the deduction category in BGG. There is you, you're smarter there, than that. There is there is <laughs> you're smarter wait, than that. there is deduction there in theory. Okay. Practically no. you don't have the time to do the deduction and see where the fuck this submarine is. <laughs> because every, you're literally just moving it and yes, seeing if it because fits. because everybody's just <laughs> shouting, but maybe but but maybe if you have a good captain, he can do the deduction and uh, lead you to the right spot so you can... Absolutely not. And it, <laughs> That's it's a four against four team game. Not Alone has a lot more deduction. And, than and, I, so <laughs> and I believe in, it's an excellent game. I just wanted to have it there. <laughs> and um, You picked that over Zendo. I'm so... No, mad. I just said I, Zendo was <laughs> not in the list. Okay, it's it's... It was not a competition with Zendo. Okay. And my number one is Tragedy Looper. So I don't wow. I don't need to say anything more about it. As uh, you said, guys, it's an amazing experience. It's uh, every time you, your head is uh, uh, leaving the, the table with a headache, but it's a sweet headache <laughs> that you want to have it uh, the other day again and again and again. And that was my number uh, one and my top three. Thank you, Ipo. Okay, so now back to me. Uh, my number three, uh, I don't know if this is a deduction game or not. I put Love Letter. I, it, is. it is a deduction game. Yeah. It is. like M More so definitely just, than Captain So <laughs> <laughs> it's You just, spend the entire game guessing. Yeah, like the, when you're playing the guard card in the first few turns of the game and guessing, that's kind of, yeah shooting in the dark but as the game progresses it's deduction you're looking at what what cards sure. have been played and then what's left and then based on the cards the other players have played you try to deduce who is the princess so Maybe i Maybe that's why i never win the game. <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing more frustrating than the beginning of a round and someone hits you with a god and they guess your card. Uh, yeah. My favorite time we played the game, it was me, Byron, I think Jason, <laughs> and someone. And it just became a joke. Every round, someone in the first round would play a guard, guard and say, oh, it was you, Dima. Yeah. And they'd say, 
Byron, are you the Baron? And every yep. time <laughs> he was. Three rounds in a row. Like three or four rounds in a row, he was the Baron. <laughs> and he was so frustrated and it was amazing. <laughs> so other than the first round of guessing, I feel like the game is pretty balanced for four players. And it's a quick deduction game. It's, it's fun. Light. Um, my number two is Alchemist. Because you all know that, you know, my science background and how I love uh, <laughs> alchemy. <laughs> so, Baby, aren't you reading The Name of the Wind? Yeah, I am. You know, there's a line in there where Kvot says, maybe I could do alchemy. I already know quite a bit about chemistry. He does say that. And, I laugh and, so hard. And then Willem or one of the guys says, <laughs> everyone thinks that <laughs> alchemy is like chemistry. But it's like comparing uh, a dog to a piece of gold or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That made so, me laugh so hard. Yeah, so you should Deja definitely... vu. Yeah. <laughs> also, you studied biology. <laughs> <laughs> Not chemistry. <laughs> I had to do all the intro to chemistry, physics. All the intro. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know? uh, okay. You just <laughs> all the intro <laughs> classes. <laughs> so, Alchemist is my sec number two because it's amazing and you can always as usual shoot in the dark and try to guess but i like putting all the ingredients together and then trying to deduce what's uh, being concocted and my number one i played a lot of deduction games like from cluedo <laughs> to incognito letters from Whitechapel, um that kind of deduction um, Fury of Dracula. What was what was the one, um, Elias? It was Watson and Holmes or something with the cops on the board, and then going through the. Uh, um, that is from Mark Chapel. No, no, Mr. Jack. Mr. Jack. Yes. Um, That's more of like an. Yeah, yeah. I guess it has okay. deduction, but it's more like an abstract. Yeah, and and I, from all these deduction games, my number one was. Detective City of Angels, just because there was ah. the story element that all these other deduction games like Incognito Letters from Whitechapel, it's it's um, sort of intriguing, like it keeps you on your toes, but it's not very fun. Everyone's kind of quiet and just doing their own thing, keeping their secrets. Actually, Letters from Whitechapel, you're you're yelling at each other, and <laughs> but. Detective City of Angels is my number one. Very good choice. Mm. And yeah, that's my top three. Of of all the ones that I said, that's the one that like I was sad I couldn't put on my list. Yes. That was my number four. Oh, so, that was my number four also. Yeah. You're not allowed number four, Scott. <laughs> You're welcome, guys. Because uh, <laughs> Tragedy Looper, I didn't put it on there. I love the game, but I think, and I'm going to say this honestly, none of you have had to read the rule book. So... Um, you you've all been taught by me, so you haven't had to go through that torture, which I think is what brings the game down a step or two for me, which is why it would be in my top ten deduction games, but not in my top three because it's really really hard to grok when you're reading the rule book. Mm -hmm. yeah. I had read the rule book and taught the game to other players, but after you taught me to. Okay, so it was so, more like a yeah, remembering. So it was, yeah. yeah, so it made sense. I mean, it made sense. I mean, <laughs> if you know the game, the first, the first time I was teaching it, I didn't understand what I was saying, like the words <laughs> that were coming out of my mouth. I didn't know what they meant. So it wasn't until I played a whole game as the mastermind that I sort of understood the game. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's the reason it wouldn't make mine. But I'm really glad that it got love, and I'm really glad the Detective City of Angels because we do love that game. Guys, thank you all for your top threes. They were amazing. Thank you for not giving us top fours or top 16s. Please let us know your top three deductive <laughs> reasoning games on our Twitter account at TT Sessions QA wow. or over at our BGG Guild. Both these links will be in the episode description. She did it on her first go. <laughs> <laughs> TTS se S session QA. Oh, uh, <laughs> I was supposed to do that. <laughs> Dima, you did a wonderful job with the Democratic Corner. And that brings us to the end of this tabletop session. Where everybody has, has an opinion. So, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say. Thank you so much for listening. 
please check out our very active Instagram account at Tabletop Sessions. You can reach us through Twitter, Dima Ware. At TT Sessions QA. She did it again, folks. Or join the conversation <laughs> over at our Board Game Geek Guild. And you can find the link to all of these in the episode description. Please rate us on iTunes or on Apple Podcasts, or rate us through your Android podcast app of choice. We'll be back in help three us weeks. Help us help you. Help us help thee, as Shakespeare the rock star said. And to quote one of my favorite writers, to quote one of my favorite designers, God damn it, you can't say you're having fun. Say bye, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Bye guys. Bye guys, have fun. Tabletop, tabletop, Bye guys, have fun. That was a good episode. Well done, Paul. Tabletop, I didn't tabletop, like my show. Tabletop, I loved it. It was so good. Tabletop, tabletop.